Hi everyone, welcome to the Budgie Academy. My name is Amy. Um, this is going to be video one of my sort of informal documentation of the journey of Gandalf. For those of you guys who don't know, Gandalf is my new cockatiel or the newest member of my flock. I adopted him in April of 2021. Um, I'm filming this today, which is mid-January of 2022, so I've had him for several months now. So I basically wanted to make an informal documentation of his journey and also maybe take you guys through day by day of what it's like to have a parrot and work through it with them because i think a lot of the time i see my followers struggle because you know people tell them oh it's going to take you time but you got to work through it and it's a lot of the times it kind of feels like you're struggling by yourself so i wanted to give you guys sort of a behind the scenes or a day-to-day -day documentation of what it's like for me because one gandalf is my first cockatiel i've worked with other exotic birds before i've worked with budgies before but i have not worked with cockatiels before so that is a first for me he is already nine years old um he was eight and a half when i adopted him based on the estimate of when he was purchased by his first owner um we guess that he's about eight and a half years old so by now he's he's nine years old um and between that and he came in with a lot of unfortunately negative experiences from his past two owners and because of that he wasn't you know able to be handled we couldn't really even feed him some millet when we or give him any treats when he first started he was really afraid of everything so i wanted to take you guys through day by day to show you the journey that it's taken from there all the way up to the progress that you see now so um with all that said let's get started so so um, the story goes back to March of 2021. That was when I still just had Dappy, Fitzy, and Callie. Those were my three budgies at the time. Dappy unfortunately got sick. I had taken, I, I woke up, he was at the bottom of the cage. And of course my entire emergency protocol kicks into place. We brought him to the veterinarian. Unfortunately, he didn't make it. The necropsy later showed that he had a heart problem, um, which was an acute onset heart problem that basically manifested in the middle of the night when, when he was sleeping. Um, but that same day, my coworker messaged me asking, hey, um, would you be interested in, in adopting this cockatiel? Now, I knew she had this cockatiel. Um, I knew that she was struggling with him. I knew that she adopted him from another coworker at the same company. So I've known about his existence for some time. Um, I brought some toys in for her to try and give to him. Maybe he'd be interested in but I, I suspected maybe she was having some trouble with him. So when she asked me like, oh, would you adopt him? That morning, it was the same day Dappy was sick. I was like, I, I can't even deal with this right now. So I told her like, you're, you're gonna have to wait because, because I simply can't deal with this right now. Um, so about six weeks later, I talked to her, we, you know, we thought about it. I talked to my boyfriend about it. Financially, I could do it. Time-wise, I could handle it. And I knew that this bird was gonna come with some pretty substantial challenges. Um, I knew that he had his first owner, who was a young teenage boy, who left the home and then the mother did not have the time to care for him. I knew that he essentially wasn't trained, has, has basically no basic life skills, couldn't step up, was not target trained, was not clicker trained, has really no means of proper communication with humans. Um, I knew he was on a poor poor diet, um, pretty much just seeds and nothing else. Um, seeds, and I was told that he would eat white bread. Great. <laughs> um, so, so there's that. I barely recognizes millet. Um, I was told that he was, when, when the first teenage boy who they had he was at the first owner's home for like six and a half or almost seven years and then when that boy left the mother didn't have enough time for him and um the second owner who has a teenage daughter bless her heart kind soul she they're a very very nice family um they have other pets as well which they take very good care of so she said you know we'd be willing to take this bird in and maybe my teenage daughter could bond with this bird and of course, um, it's really hard sometimes, you know, between a rehoming, if the bird doesn't come in with a lot of handling experience, it's very hard for someone who's a beginner with no formal training to be able to 
figure out what to do with this bird and sadly the bird already had a preference towards men because of some less than ideal handling situation from his first home so when he came in that was exacerbated by the rehoming and the lack of knowledge in his second home made it essentially made it worse um, and so they began to struggle with him. I was told that in order to get him in the cage, they would have to take some millet or some bread, put it in the cage, and when he would go in to eat, they would have to shut the door. Um, he was only really had time to come out for some short periods during the day. They told me he screams in the morning, which a lot of times when people say that birds are screaming, they're not actually screaming, they're actually calling for some particular reason. Um, and it's just that the calling is particularly persistent, that's all that it is. Screaming, just FYI, screaming is a very specific behavioral problem. It's a very specific, almost like an obsessive or a compulsive behavioral problem. It is not just persistent calling. If a bird is calling persistently, there is a reason that they are calling, but just persistent loud calls is not the same thing as screaming, which is a very specific behavioral problem. So they told me he screams in the morning. From what I could judge from their daily schedule, he only gets to come out for a larger period of time in the morning. So as he sees the sun comes up, what he's probably doing is anticipation calling is what I, what I expected that he was probably doing. Um, so I thought that's fine, you know, it's whatever. If he, if he calls in the morning, he calls in the morning. I'm perfectly fine with it. Parrots call in the morning and they tend to call in the evening. That's very, very normal parrot behavior. Um, so I thought, okay, that's no problem. And uh, so I thought, okay, I, I will try my best. We know he has a preference for men over women. I don't know how severe it is. We know he's on a poor diet. We know he has minimally handling experience and he calls in the morning, which I highly suspected would probably go away when he arrived at the house and his routine was fixed. So middle of April, we went, we drove there like 45 minutes to, to pick him up. At the time, because it was during COVID and it was, it was still somewhat cold here in Boston, I had a hat on, a hat and a face mask on. So a hat, face mask, thick jacket and scarf. And so because of the way my hair was tied back, it, you couldn't see my hair. And when she handed him to me in a travel cage and I picked him up, he immediately like perked up, looked at me and he like leaned toward me like he was so happy to see me. He went, which is what I learned now, what he does when he's affectionate towards a person that he perceives to be male. So at the time, because of the way I had my hair and my face covered, he thought I was a man. And because I wasn't talking, I was like, hello, I said like hi or something. and. I, you know, I didn't say a lot of words and because of the way I looked, he thought I was a man. So he very quickly perked up and I know that made the, the owner feel better because it felt like he, he liked me very quickly, which, which does happen. Some parents just have a preference for how some other people, certain people look and they do have a preference for that and they pick their people and that's totally fine. Um, so we, we brought him in the car, we drove home. And that's when, typically when I get home, the first thing that I do is I want to try to evaluate this bird's state of mind and let them settle in because it's a big change. When they first come in, it's a big change from one home to another. No matter how comfortable a bird is with human handling, it's a big change, right? So he comes in and he starts calling. You're full. That's what you are. You're full and demanding calling, persistently calling, which later on, again, my first cockatiel, so I'm not super familiar with which exact calls are for what, but you can kind of tell from his body language, um, just from, again, my first cockatiel, so I'm learning the body language kind of on the fly based on what I know from a lot of other species. So I could tell that it was more of like an alert call. He's like persistently alerting, basically like, danger! danger and just calling and calling and calling and it was quite loud if you're there physically in person it, it's quite loud and my poor boyfriend <laughs> i could tell he was getting concerned because he was like wow like this this bird is really really loud like a lot louder than the budgies are the budgies chatter every once in a while they get happy you know squawk 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 it doesn't seem to be a big deal but that one was probably the loudest bird call that he had ever experienced and he was like persistently calling i think for like a good like 15 to 20 minutes he was like persistently like calling and calling so 
Um, but after a while, I was like, let me just give you some time. Like, you're fine. <laughs> you're totally okay. Um, and I, I actually opened the cage. I have a tree stand there. And typically, depending on the bird situation, I will either directly put them in the cage or let them out. The way that I typically prefer to start birds is I prefer to start them in a bird-proof space outside the cage so that they have the ability to move around and they're not just stuck in the cage. Because what I find tends to happen is if they're in the cage right away, then later when they come out, they panic, right? So typically I prefer to start them outside the cage in a room that's bird-proofed. So if they do fly, if they do go somewhere, the whole room is bird-proof. So it doesn't matter where they go, they can sleep anywhere they like. If they don't want to go back in the cage, it's not a big deal. Um, so I let him out and he climbed up on top of the cage and he looked around and then I tried feeding him a little bit of bread and I was like, okay, let's try. He had a little bit of bread in this tiniest little food bowl in the travel cage, which like his head obviously couldn't even fit in there. Um, so I, I, I took a little piece of bread and I fed him some and he actually was willing to eat it. And I was like, oh, okay, this is like not as bad. Like he's willing to have a piece of bread. And I thought like, okay, like that, that means that like, at least he knows how to take food from a hand because that's, that's like one of the first skills that not every bird knows. Um, and then I moved him over to like a little stand we had near the kitchen island. And usually what I like to do is just let the bird sit there and watch me or and my boyfriend sort of exist and let them kind of figure out the space and let them try to try to have them initiate the interaction with us. I already know he likes the bread. I know he can fly. I know that he's decent on the wing. I was told in his previous home that both of his previous homes have had cats and that he was allowed to interact with the cats, which is a big no-no and that is very dangerous. Um, but he would apparently uh, tease tease the cats. Again, many reasons as to why cats and parrots should not be allowed to interact. Um, but I knew that he could fly. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna just put him next to me. My boyfriend and I, we're gonna just watch some TV and eat dinner. That's typically what I like to do. So there's some sound going on, um, some sound going on. We're sitting there not looking at them, just kind of doing our own thing and eating and a lot of, and I know that he does recognize from what the previous owners told me, I do know that he recognizes human beings eating, that he does recognize that if human beings are eating, he can come and he can also get some food. So I was kind of hoping that by seeing us eat, he would think about initiating that interaction with us. And so I was like getting stuff ready. I This was the kitchen, so I couldn't cook because he was in the kitchen. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna quickly microwave some stuff. Um, I don't remember if I microwaved something or we ordered food because it was so many months ago, but it was basically because he was in the kitchen, we, we couldn't cook. Um, so we sat down and as I was prepping and like setting up the table, my boyfriend went up to him and tried to see like if he would step up, he, he wasn't able to step up, which is okay. He would just kind of like back away. That's fine, that means no. Um, and then my boyfriend tried to bob his head and a lot of times with cockatiels, like, they, they will do the, the dance, the up and down dance. And uh, shockingly, we found out that he's he's a big fan of my boyfriend and, and the, the dance. And that was when we realized that he does have an extremely strong preference for men. It's not a little bit, it, it's a big preference. It's a big difference um, between how he feels about men and how he feels about women. Because when I was, oh, I for, sorry, I accidentally left something out because while he was out and I was like setting up the table, I made the realization that um, if I looked at him and if I made eye contact with him and I made eye contact just, just like a half a second too long, like more than like a second, he would actually fly at my face and attempt to intimidate me or what's called a space increasing behavior. He would fly at my face and land on my head, but it's he would essentially fake attack my face in an effort to get me to go away. And that was very shocking to me because one, most of my experiences with budgies, who as you probably know, are very flighty, they will always choose flight over fight. And two, parrots in general are flight animals. Like even though some parrots are a little more headstrong, like they are still in general flight animals. So to see a flight animal like that, a prey animal who should be choosing to run away, react in such a way where they actively choose to attack someone 
tells me that he has some kind of pre-existing notion about something bad that's going to happen. So he has some existing association with my eye contact and not just anyone, it's not anyone because my boyfriend could look at him, he could stare at him and it, it didn't matter. But if I looked at him for more than like a second, he would immediately attack my face. And that's when I learned that he has some kind of pre-existing association with women looking at him. I suspected it was women because of what the previous owner told me. But then again, he's very new. It might just be a new thing. It takes, for those of you who don't know, the 333 rule, um, definitely go look it up. But essentially, it takes animals time to settle in. But even if it takes animals time to settle in, usually it's not a full on aggression. Usually they're just kind of trying to figure out what's going on. So this was a very, very interesting response to me. But it was very clear in that moment, the contrast was very clear. The difference between how he perceives men and how he perceives women was very, very clear to me. So I thought, okay, immediately I knew kind of all of the different things that might have to happen is that I, ha I have to go a lot slower with him, that the training is going to rely on my boyfriend's bond with him, that it might be that he has to do something first and I have to follow, right? Um, probably I have to do all the things for him. I feed him, I bring him food, I bring him treats, I bring him everything. Um, and I suspected that that's how it was gonna have to happen. Um, so we sit down, we eat dinner, we just let him sit there and hang out and miraculously this bird flies over and starts walks right up onto the laptop and starts leaning into the laptop and singing into the laptop. And I was like, oh my goodness, okay, fantastic. So he's not terrified of human beings, good. Um, has some, some pre-existing situations, associations, negative associations with women, but we will work on that, right? But he's not terrified of human beings. So I was like, great, we're, we're going somewhere. So after dinner, we let him hang out with my boyfriend some more. I brought the, his his older cage in. I decided to start with the old cage before I set up the newer one. I just wanted to give him a chance to kind of see something, um, something familiar because he had not changed cages his whole life. He had been in that cage his whole life. Um, like as in that was the cage he had associated with him. And not like he never left the cage in his life, right? Um, but that was what he was familiar with. So I was like, let's start with what he already has. So he's quarantining in the bedroom and kitchen's half of the house, and then the budgies get this side, which is the office and living room, right? So I was like, all right. And we 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 couldn't touch him, we couldn't carry him, we because he doesn't know how to step up, he doesn't know anything, but he was on top of the travel cage. So we just picked up the travel cage and moved him into the bedroom and he hopped onto his his normal cage, which I had set up with, you know some some perches and toys and things and uh he was the cage is like actually a dome shape and he was hanging on the side of the cage and he wouldn't go in and i was like all right here we are and my boyfriend was like what do we do what do we do he won't go in and you know this is a bird who doesn't know how to step up doesn't know how to target there's just no means of communicating with him other than to herd him into the cage and i said no um he's like what do we do and i said he can sleep there <laughs> and I said you know and he's like oh my god what do you do? I said it's fine it's not a big deal because one of the reasons why you want to really bird proof the room that they start in is because this happens pretty often where you can't communicate with the bird the bird has no basic training or life skills whatsoever and so he's terrified he has no idea where he's going so he just doesn't want to go in and I said it's fine he can sleep on top of the cage the room is bird proofed he's not going anywhere um, probably he's not even gonna leave that one spot because he's he's terrified, right? So he, he doesn't know where he is. So I I just let him. We just left the cage door open and I just let him sleep there. And then um, in the morning we woke up and in the morning he started doing his the first time which I heard was the his singing like the whistling, right? So cockatiels then sing. They tend to whistle, and that was the first time we heard the singing. And he flew actually like down onto the bed and went over to my boyfriend's face and would sing to him. And I thought, okay, this is great. He already has a bond to, to my boyfriend. He has some kind of affection toward my boyfriend. He hates me with his entire soul because of everything he had been through before. That's fine. It's totally okay. Like I will slowly win him over. I would rather him really like my boyfriend, have it easy for my boyfriend because between the two of us, I'm the one who's who, you know, went to school for all of this. 
I can handle it. It's totally fine. It's fine if they're not my BFF. It's fine if they're not obsessed with me. I can live with that. I've worked with animals for a long time. It's totally no problem. So I'd rather it be easier for him and harder for me than the other way around, right? So that's also, you know, day one, we realize like he doesn't call. At least he didn't call in the morning at all. He just wakes up, sing, sing, whistle, whistle, and he was perfectly delightful. And then he put himself away. He walked himself into his cage and he put himself away. And I was like, oh, all right, fantastic, all <laughs> right? Um, so there was some food in there, some water in there. He went, he ate. Um, always, typically when the birds come in, I start them on whatever food they already recognize until I see they're already eating. If I see that they're actively eating, I can start to slowly, slowly incorporate some little bits of new food, either by upgrading the seed mix a little bit or with cooked grains, something. But first I want to see them eat. Once I know that they know where the food is, then we can start. But so he went, he ate, he drank. I was like, this is great. This is fantastic. We're, we're getting off to a good start here. And uh, the second day, pretty much most, pretty much the same thing. I just let him sit on top of the cage. I walk in, walk out, live my normal life. Um, so he can just see how we react, right? Um, and very quickly, I learned something about him, which they had not told me before, but it was pretty obvious, um, which was that I could tell from his body language, he would get very defensive and, and preparing for an aggressive sort of space increasing behavior every time I walked in the door. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I know he doesn't like me, but you know, just from me walking in and walking out, it's very clear that he was defensive, but not in, in a very strange way. It almost as what I noticed is that he would be sitting inside the cage and if I walk in, he would quickly run out of outside of the cage as if he was like afraid that I would shut the door and shut him in there. And so I had a conversation with his previous owner and I asked her and I was like, you know, what's going on? Like, why, why, you know, does, does he not like the cage? Like what's going on? She said, well, you know, he wouldn't go back because um, he just, he just, when he would come out, he would never want to go back. And so in order to get him to go back, what they would have to do is put some millet or treats inside the cage. And when he went in, they would quickly shut it and he would call and he would want to come out, but he, but they couldn't, right? They couldn't let him out. So he was basically stuck in there until, until, you know, people got home from work, which was like eight or nine hours later. And if he's lucky, he gets to come out. If not, then it's the next morning. And that explains a lot of the anticipation calling because some days you would only get to come out in the morning. Hence, the morning is a really big deal. And because he wasn't getting to come out enough, that's why he wouldn't want to go back in the cage, right? I've, I've never had birds who don't want to go back inside the cage because they get plenty of time outside. So them being inside is not a big deal because they know, okay, I might go inside for five minutes and come back out again, in and out, in and out for random periods of time. It's not a big deal to them. But for him and his mind, if he went in, he would not get to come out again until the next day. So that's why he was a little bit defensive about it. And so first thing out of the gate, I already knew. I told my boyfriend, I said, he cannot have the door shut to his cage. One of us is gonna have to be here pretty much 24 seven. Um, so that's, that's where we started. I'm dead serious. We started, I would just walk in and just not look at him. I just feel like I just walk in and do my own thing as if he didn't exist and walk out. And after, you know, a couple of days, I started to see that improve. He would, when I would walk in, he would look at me but start to learn that I'm not gonna come shut that door. You can sit in the cage, sit outside the cage, you can sit wherever you like, but I'm not the one coming to shut that door. Um, the only time we would shut the door is that he would put himself away at night. On the second day, on the second night, he put himself away at night. And then only when he was completely ready to sleep, it was like 11 o'clock at night when we were gonna lay down and go to sleep. I asked my boyfriend, I said, I'm gonna leave the room, only then you get up and close the cage door because I cannot do that. He already does it, has a negative association with women. I cannot be the one to close the cage door ever, at least for the not until you know this whole thing blows over for the next couple months and we establish a foundation of, of what you know what the cage means. Until we've established a different picture of that in his mind, I cannot be the one to close the cage door. So I leave. A few minutes later, randomly at some random time, and I told my boyfriend at some random time, so he doesn't 
associate me leaving with the cage immediately closing. So I leave, at some random time, some minutes later, he gets up, shuts the door. The bird doesn't mind because he's already put himself away to sleep. Fantastic. The next morning, we wake up, he starts, you know, sing, sing, whistle, whistle again in the morning. And that's when I'm the one who goes to open the cage. So in order to try and sort of tilt everything in my favor, the strategy was really to just, I do everything he likes. I bring the food, I open the cage door, I change his water, uh, I bring the millet, I bring the treats, all that kind of stuff, and my boyfriend just exists, okay? Just him existing is enough <laughs> for him, him, him to be very happy. So um, that was basically the strategy. Anytime the cage door was open, the whole day, one of us was at home, at, one of us was home at all times. This was like a month and a half. Yeah, maybe like four to five weeks where one of us was always home and this was kind of still in the middle of covid pandemic where both of us work remotely for the most part and so it ended up working out well because of that um but that that became crucial just the fact that he was allowed to have the door open all the time he ate lunch, he started eating lunch with my boyfriend he would you know my boyfriend would share a little bit of a little piece of bread with him because that was what he recognized though so it was a it was a useful bonding tool and he began to kind of get a little more comfortable after a couple days and that's when I would come home I would go to work for just a, sh a short period a couple of hours like physically go to the office for a short period during the afternoons so I would go when I would come home from work I would come in and I would just lay down flat on the bed which was maybe like two and a half three feet away from his cage and we knew that he would fly down and walk around on the bed when you know my boyfriend was sitting there so I know he's not afraid of the bed so I would just lay down with my stomach on the bed, head down and I would text on my phone or something so that I'm not staring at him because I'm very, I'm, I'm kind of an impatient person. So I, if I text on my phone, I won't realize that time is passing. And as I started to do that kind of day by day, I noticed that he would start to get a little brave. He would come down and he would actually sit on my back or on like on my foot all the way on the end of my foot and I and one of the reasons I like to lay down in that position is I figured that it's very non-threatening. I'm sure in all of his years that he's learned that when human beings are laying down on their stomach, it's not very easy for human beings to get up. So I think he's learned that that's kind of a safe position. And I think that I was right in the sense that I would lay down flat kind of day after day. And he realized that I was going to lay there for a while. And he started to, you know, in, initiate that interaction. He would lay down, he would come and sit on my back. He would sit on the back of my leg, on my foot and sit there and sing. And I was like, oh my God, now we are getting somewhere, right? During the day, in the coming in and out, we realized that he wasn't okay with taking food from hands. So that made training very, very tricky because he wouldn't take food. Um, if I try to offer him a little bit of millet, he would rather bite or, or lunge or threat, threaten to bite rather than take food from the hen. Tells me that that is consistent with what has happened to him before where people use the millet to try to, to essentially trick him. And this is why you should never ever lie to your animals. If you have to do something unpleasant, sometimes they don't get a choice. If it's a medical procedure or it's just an emergency, a time crunch where they don't get a choice, you never want to use food to trick them into doing it. So basically what they were doing is they would show him the millet, he would come and eat it, or he would come and try to eat it and they would either towel him or grab him. He would never get the millet that, that he saw that they promised him essentially. Um, so they would hold the millet and when he would get close, they would towel him and put him in the cage or they would use the millet to trick him. And once he would go inside the cage, they would shut the door. So he very quickly learned to not follow the millet. Wherever the millet is, is where I am not going. That's essentially how, how he was thinking. Um, and so it was very, very difficult because I would literally leave a piece of millet on the top of the cage, leave the room for like a solid half hour, come back and it would be completely untouched. And I was like, this is crazy. It's not even inside the cage. I mean, I would leave it on, on top of the cage right next to him and it was completely untouched. He wouldn't touch this at all. And I, would, I knew he was, it wasn't because he wasn't hungry. It was like a, the first thing in the morning, I would leave it there for half an hour while I go and refill his food bowl. Nothing, he wouldn't touch it. He just wouldn't touch it at all. 
and that told me that he has you know quite a bit of extensive negative experience with this thing so I was like okay okay you know let's let's try something different with time walking in walking out establishing the routine for him every morning the routine is the same every morning we wake up me the woman goes over there opens the door for him i lay back down he gets to come out on his own terms he flies over to the bed walks over to my boyfriend sings to his face and then he flies back to his cage or somewhere else and usually he like go he would go up to the either on top of the door or on top of the the curtain rod and he would sit there and sing at the wall fine all that's fine and then i'd go refill his food We'd hang out a little more. He would hang out with my boyfriend some more. I try and offer him a bit of millet. And even if he doesn't eat it, I'm still gonna offer it. So what I would do is I would offer it. He wouldn't eat it. It's totally okay. If he if he didn't eat it, I would just offer it. And after a while, I would just take it back even though he didn't eat it. So he can now learn that this is the routine, right? Millet appears, whether you eat it or not, it doesn't matter, nothing's happening. Um, and then I would go in the afternoon to the office for a few hours, come home, lay flat on my stomach, let him walk on the walk around on the bed, walk on my back, do whatever he wanted to do, and I would just not move. Everything would be fine, nothing would happen, and he would go back to his cage, and I would get up and I would leave. So that was like our, our interaction. And I would just let him initiate that interaction and work with it at, at his pace. And eventually, Time began to pass, day in, day out, the routine starts to build and he's, as he gets a sense of certainty that this is the routine and he realizes that he doesn't have to be like that. Like he doesn't have to be scared that I'm gonna come in and shut the door on him. Um, I later learned from the previous owner when they would try to get him back in the cage, what they used to do was they would take the millet, put it in the cage and when he would go in, they would shut the door. Of course he would get smart about it and stop going in the cage because they're smart. Uh, so what they would do is they would take the tree, put it in the cage and leave the room. And when they would hear him climbing into the cage, they would run really fast into the room and shut the door. Now you can see why he has a strong distrust of women walking into the room quickly all of a sudden. So I thought, okay, what else can I do to try and make my appearance not so shocking? I think it was like, scary or like surprising startling to him for me to like suddenly appear um so i thought like okay like let me let me do something so what i started doing was if i'm about to enter the room like i'm coming down the hallway or from the kitchen i would start calling him and i just you know come up with some random name so that's why i call him mr sir like sir mr bird sir mr sir and I would, I would call him and tell him, so he hears my voice that, hey, I'm, I'm about to come into the room, okay? So it's not like, it's not like me just suddenly bursting into the room with no, uh, no warning whatsoever, because that was a bit, because of all of the negative associations we had, for a normal bird, maybe that's not so bad, but for him, it was, it was a bit much, right? So I thought, okay, let me like announce my arrival and then walk in. So I started doing that. Every time I would, before I would walk in, I'd be like, Mr. Sir, I'm gonna come to the bedroom, okay? Just so he would hear my voice. Obviously he has no idea what I'm saying, but just so that he hears me before he sees me, so he's able to predict that I am gonna come in. I would come in, I would lay down, I would do my thing, I would leave and I wouldn't shut the cage door, right? I only open cage doors in the morning. I never shut them every single day. My boyfriend is the one. We wait until he goes back in the cage. Only then do we shut the door. When we know he's been in there for like two, three hours, he's completely settled down for the night. Only then it's then my boyfriend gets up and shuts the cage door and he doesn't care at that point anymore. So that was how we made it through like the first, I don't know, several days to a week maybe. Um, it was definitely interesting at the beginning. Um, I've never had a bird with with this much sort of previous like negative association baggage. Um, he is the oldest of all of my birds right now. He is, when he arrived, he was like eight and a half. So he's nine now. Um, and I had never seen a bird with such a strong gender preference before. So this was definitely an interesting experience. Um, so we'll call this part one. Uh, since I've been 
since I've had him since April and it is now January, there's a lot to catch up on, but I'm gonna sort of break it up into, into pieces. So we'll leave it there for now and uh, I'll see you guys in the next installment of my informal documentation, my, my the Chronicles of Gandalf, Gandalf's Journey um, videos. So yeah, see ya.